Hello and welcome to another episode of Wiggy Reviews. If you enjoyed Ernest Klein's debut novel, Ready Player One, then maybe it's time for you to check out his next one. So let's go ahead and jump right in with Armada by Ernest Klein. If you're not familiar with Ernest Klein's debut novel, uh, Ready Player One, that was the story about the post-apocalyptic world where everyone kind of was always plugged into this virtual reality world. Well, Armada has nothing to do with that world. It's a different world altogether. Uh, this Armada takes place kind of in modern day, uh, and it opens with our main character, Zach Lightman, seeing a flying saucer. What? Just hopping right into it. Um, and he recognizes the flying saucer as a ship from one of his favorite video games. <laughs> um, and so that kind of starts a domino effect of things happening where he thinks he's crazy, but the basic plot of the book, I'm gonna go basic, basic, basic. The basic plot of the book is the aliens from a video game are real. The go US government has been using the video game to train the people of the earth in order to fight an oncoming in uh, attack by an armada of aliens um, and the game they've been using to train people has actually been two video games the first one was terra firma which taught people how to use mechanized uh, robot uh, drones to fight on the ground on earth and then the second game that came out after that is armada um, which taught them to pilot ships and attend fly basically drone ships and to defend the earth and attack the aliens and now the world must come together to to save itself while also discovering the real secrets of this unknown alien race basic 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 <laughs> zach lightman is our main character he is a teenage boy who is one of the top players of Armada, because Armada is an online game. And um, he's actually ranked number six? Number six. He's ranked number six in the world. Uh, and he lost his father when he was a baby. Uh, his father died when... His father died at the age of 19 after just after he was born uh, so he never got to meet his father but he has all his father's collectibles all his video games all his books all of his music everything his father ever collected he he, he has it anyways so the aliens appear and attack and it's revealed that they are the game the, the aliens in the video game are real not exactly real they aren't the squid people that are portrayed in the video game and Zach and a few select people are pulled from their regular, li regular lives to join the Earth Defense Alliance. And they discover it's all real. They even discover some of the missions they went on in the video games were actually real. <laughs> that they actually were fighting aliens. Um, but it's all, and I guess I should mention, it's all drone fighting. There's no actual aliens or people in the ships or in the mecha, mechas running around. They're all drones being controlled from the safety of the home or a uh, bunkers dug deep, 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 deep underground, safe from attack. Um, yeah. Uh, there's a lot of things that I can't talk about because I don't want to spoil anything because th there are secrets revealed and twists and turns. Uh, so I'm just going to go into the major characters that we see, that we interact with. So we also meet Zach's boss. Uh, he works at a video game store. Uh, his boss's name is Ray Ware... Oh, I'm gonna get this horribly wrong, and I know it's a reference to something, but I just, my brain... Uh, Ray Wierbowski. Ray Wierbowski! Um, who is his boss, and kind of has a similar thing like his dad, like his dad, so I think that's why Zach kind of kind of likes Ray, because Ray kind of talks about, like, oh, the conspiracy, the aliens are coming, blah, 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 blah. the government is secretly brainwashing everyone and all that, so he's really funny, I love him, uh, he, he's, 
And also, I also love the fact when Ray says, like, he will straight up just tell a customer, like, that game sucks. Why are you buying it? <laughs> I love that. I think that's hilarious. Uh, he's like, I would appreciate that more. I would actually like an honest person to be like, no, that game sucks. Don't buy that game. <laughs> uh, I know it's kind of counterintuitive to being in a video game store, but it was still funny. When <laughs> I read that, I was like, yes, that would be me. <laughs> um... And then, I guess, uh, that's kind of all for the normal people. I mean, he, he has two friends, two best friends, uh, who also play. Um, but they don't really have a big part except to be like, oh, he has friends. <laughs> they play, they play the games together. <laughs> um, and so let's just go right to when the aliens are revealed to be real. And Zack suddenly finds himself being whisked away on a spaceship, uh, to be gathered secretly like a, a ship comes and like says we're looking for zach lightman and everyone's like oh? and zach goes with them but they don't explain to everybody what's happening they don't explain to zach what happened what's happening until they're like a good distance away from where they pick him up and uh <laughs> and then he gets there and they learn that one of the characters from the video game who's been kind of their commanding officer admiral vance is actually real a real person and he is like the the stereotypical guy, he has an eye patch, he has a scar across his face, he's a big tough guy, and he does, he follows the, he follows his orders, he never strays from his orders, he would, uh, all that. Um, and then he also meets a girl named Alexis Larkin, who goes by Lex, and she's not very good at the Armada game, which is the one about the spaceships, where you can fly the space drones. Uh, she's one of the top players in Terra Firma, so she's a pro at handling the mechs and the uh, the robot robot drones that are on the ground, uh, you know, helping the ships if the alien ships get through and they land and they start attacking ground, then they get in their drones and they start pop, 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 attacking and punching and flying and doing super big jumps and really cool stuff. Um, she's She's described as a goth chick who is a hacker, a hacker goth chick, um, and I, I, I don't really have a problem with her character, I mean, I think she's a, a really, well, I think she's a well-written female character, uh, I, I guess the problem I had was the instantaneous falling in love first sight thing, but I guess you could also chalk that up to... We're gonna die! The aliens are coming! It's all real! Oh god! And I'm a night. I'm a 16 year old, 17, 18, 17, 18 year old. We're all 17, 16, 18 year olds, and we haven't had sex and blah blah blah. Anyways, I'm going off on a tangent. I just wanted to talk about the characters, but then it all turned into sex. What's wrong with me? I blame the culture I grew up in. Um. I guess let's just talk about the aliens. So in the video game, the aliens are called Sobrukais, and they are portrayed as squid... squidbillies. <laughs> uh, no, not squidbillies. But they're, they're portrayed as these squid creatures who live under... Uh, their planet is like an ice planet with an ocean underneath, and they live in the ocean underneath. But it, when they find out that the aliens are real, they learn that the aliens are actually a lot closer than in the game. They are actually living on Europa, one of the moons around around uh, Saturn, and so they're called Europans, which come which brings comedy into later scenes where people keep saying Europeans. We're fighting the Europeans, and it's like you stupid idiot, Europeans get it right. <laughs> um, that's funny. Um. While Zack and Lex and all these other people are there were with Admiral Vance, uh, their base is attacked, uh, and they taste their first bit of combat, real combat. It's not a game anymore, it's real combat. People can actually die uh, if they aren't able to keep the Europans back. And it's interesting... So now I'm gonna awkwardly segue into my next, into the next point, and we're just gonna go into like the small details of the book. Um, it's interesting because no one dies in the first attack. People are injured. At least if if people died, they they weren't mentioned in a way that I can remember. Uh, but a lot of people were injured due to Zach, because <laughs> Zach did something silly. 
but this was something that kind of was weird for me. And it's these little details that are going to kind of influence the way I, re I rated this book. The small details I am talking about are the fact that up until a certain point in the book, it's all still kind of considered a game. Even though the realization that these are real aliens, these are real drones coming to attack the cities and, you know, basically the planet, to attack the planet and to basically wipe out Earth, uh, humans. There's still the fear that this is happening, that it's real. There's the fear of, oh my gosh, look at how many are coming to fight us. Are we going to be able to hold them off? Like, that fear is there. But until a certain point in the book, it doesn't feel fully real. Like, I know the characters are feeling it. But then, when it becomes real, as in when people start to die, it feels kind of weird. And it feels kind of out of place, which is weird because the whole point is that they're coming to kill the humans. Because when I read it and the first person we actually see die happens, occurs, in the book, it... I didn't believe it. I was like, nah, he's not dead, he's fine. And I was like, I didn't, but he was very clearly dead. And it, it was... I think what it is. I think what it is. Up until a certain point, the risks were there, but they weren't affecting the characters in any way that made me care. And then when it started to affect them in a way where I should care, it came. It happened so quickly and so out of left field and so violently that it just felt out of place it felt like a different story, which is weird because in, and I'm, I'm going to be doing a lot of comparing and contrasting to Ready Player One. So I'm sorry if you haven't read that book. You should read that book, it's really good. <laughs> um, but I'm going to be doing a lot of comparing and contrasting because Ready Player One, I think, got things right that this one kind of lost track of. In Ready Player One, the threat, the violence, the risk of life and death were always there. Uh, because that was how the world was created. The world was created in a post-apocalyptic world where people were struggling to survive, and the idea of people being very, very, uh, the, the idea of people doing violence against one another wasn't so far-fetched. And yes, this is aliens doing violence against humans, but it still, it still doesn't feel as accepting as it did in Ready Player One. No. <laughs> um, yeah. So that was something that was weird. Because it, it, it took me out just when that first death happened. After that, it was fine. In the sense that it felt more real, real to me. But that first death that was very graphically described, it just felt wrong. But it got better after that. So I kind of forgive it, but not really, because it did for a moment kind of snap me out of the story in a bad way. I guess it was supposed to. It was supposed to shock to be like, oh, this is real. Like, people are really going to die in a horrible way. Um, and then, yeah, so it was weird. Um, I'm going to just go ahead and go into some other things that... Ready Player One had the excuse... This is going to sound very picky, I know, but... Eh. Ready Player One had the excuse where there was a competition going on where no one really knew what the rules were, but they knew it had something to do with someone's love of video games, movies, and 80s trivia and all that. So everyone in the world had an excuse to know every single line from a movie. They had an excuse to know every odd fact and odd uh, reference in the world. And I actually underlined, I took a pen through the book, because, and I actually underlined every reference to something. Uh, whether it was a book, a movie, TV show, video game, event, during a specific time period. I actually went through and I underlined it. Because after the first chapter, it actually kind of got on my nerve. In the sense that... I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, 
This is going to sound so bad because I'll be the first to tell you I am a nerd. I grew up watching Star Trek. I grew up watching Star Wars. I grew up reading, watching the old Hobbit and Lord of the Ring cartoons. And if you don't know what those are, that is some obscure shit right there. So I will be the, and I grew up watching the Dune movies, the new, the old one and the TV made for TV one. Like, and I read the books and I, all this stuff. So I will be the first to tell you that I am kind of a nerd and I kind of know this stuff, but I could not give you that a whole monologue, and I mean like a monologue, like ten plus lines of do- of a monologue from a mo- from a movie. Un- like <laughs> the one that bothered me was one from Dune. A char- two characters start saying this monologue, and the reason it bothers me is because those kids. I don't feel would have had any interest in that movie or those books. <laughs> this is going to sound horrible, but only because it was a bit of a stretch for me to believe that they would have that entire monologue wholly memorized. And I know people who are obsessed with Dune. They don't even know that whole monologue. They have to look it up to get the entire thing right. So this is me being horribly nitpicky. The reason it bothers me, I think, is because when you do that... The writing no longer becomes yours. Like, when he uses a lot of them saying quotes from movies, quotes from books, quotes from TV shows, that's no longer his writing. He's taking that from someone else and putting it in his book. And in a sense, he was able to do that well in Ready Player One because it wasn't a lot of it. It only happened when it needed to happen, when they were doing the tests and solving the riddles and all that, so it made sense. In this, it doesn't make so much sense except to show how many references you can make in this story. Because I'm sorry, when I when, when the world's ending, I don't feel like I'm going to be quoting everything that happened in a movie. I, I'm, I'm just being so nitpicky and I feel bad, but it's just something that bothered me after a while. When he did that monologue, that really ticked me off, because it's like, you could have written something much better than that monologue. Or, I think maybe it would have even worked if it wasn't perfect. Because, I don't know about you, when I'm terrified, and when I'm trying to remember monologues or quotes from movies, I get them wrong. You see them all the time online. Quotes that everyone always gets wrong. Number one, Luke, I am your father. He never says Luke, it's no, I am your father. Like, people get quotes wrong all the time. And that's not, the point isn't to get it right. The point is that you know it. And you know, you and another person share a moment where you re- you know what that quote is from, even if you get it wrong. Um, so I, I'm going off on a horrible tangent, but I, I just, it bothered me so much because after a while I just had to underline because it was like, reference, 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 reference. And it's like, I want something original. Which I got during the fighting, during the battles, during the intergalactic ship flying blowing crap up that was great like when he when it was that it was like just oh it was great the action was just engaging i was totally involved i was totally committed i was totally worried that they were going to be blown out of the sky and it was great but then you get these next chapters where everything is a reference i find it to be a little bit of lazy writing because you, it makes me think that you couldn't think of something better. And to be fair, some of those quotes, there's nothing better. But it's still, like, ah. Uh, it, it also made me think, oh god, I want to live in this world. Everyone's a nerd. It's great. Everyone he ever talked to was like that. Everyone who was the top officers were these nerdy people. And I'm like, you know, non-nerds play video games too. And non-nerds can be really good at video games too. Um, I can't talk about too much more. Like, again, there are just so many spoilers, and I don't want to give anything away. I don't want to, I, like, I liked the book. Like, the idea wasn't, may not have been wholly original. Uh, aliens in a video game ending up being real. It's been done before, but everything's been done before. Ready Player One, I'm sure, has been done before. It's not... That's not the point. The point is that it was the fact that there were so many references and there wasn't a reason for these characters to 
have these all memorized. Ready Player One had the excuse where it was part of a, I'm going to say this again, it was part of a competition. They needed to know it because they didn't know what was going to be asked of them. So it was excusable for them to have entire movies memorized. And I'm done, Ari, I'm done talking about it now because I know I'm ticking off a lot of people because that's probably why you loved the book and that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> if that's why you loved the book, that's why you loved the book. Uh, for me, it just felt like a little too much. And a little too much bending reality that that many people would know all of that. Yeah. So, what would I rate it after that horrible rant off I did? I'd give it a 7 out of 10. 7 out of 10. Because it took me out of the story for two major things. One, it's a story about aliens invading. And when they killed people, it took me out. Which shouldn't happen in an alien invasion book, I think. Uh, the references became too much for me. Which brought me out because they were distracting. So, 7 out of 10 for Armada by Ernest Cline. Uh, and if you are, if this has got you interested in what I had to say about Ready Player One, then I'll put a link, not over here, I'll put a link over here somewhere so that you can check that out. Um, yeah, I am going to honestly say I loved Ready Player One. I would read, I, I read, reread it many times. This one, it still was great. I still enjoyed it. The nerd in me was happy. The video game nerd player in me was happy. But it was just those two major things that just took me out of it. And I could go into the other things, but I can't because they're spoilers. I don't want to spoil anything for you because there were a couple other things that made me a little, uh. But I think those, those things in particular are very much your own opinion. So I'm not going to talk about them because I also want you to read the book because it's a good book. Next week, I am going to be reviewing Warded Man by Peter V. Brett, which is the first book in a trilogy. And yeah, here we go. So thank you for joining me for Wiggy Reviews, and I will see you next time. Bye!